Awesome. Um, thank you, guys. Did you guys enjoy worshiping God through song? I hope so, because if, if not, then we don't have to get them to come back now. Now, you enjoy it? Was it like it? All right. Okay. It seems like they want you guys to come back later. Um, friends, yeah, so <laughs> we are um, ending off our series through Ephesians. Now, if you've missed any of it, please do go and um, catch up online, highfell.online, where you'll be able to get all of the podcast, either video or audio you can choose. I really believe that this past couple of weeks, as we've been preaching through the book of Ephesians, that God has been speaking a very specific message to us as His church, and that God is preparing us for what He's busy doing in the world. Now, I hope that you guys are not oblivious to the fact that we are in a global pandemic. I hope that you guys also know that because God is sovereign, he is either the orchestrator of everything that happens, meaning that he, allows, that he is the reason behind it, or He allows it. Nothing happens without God's permission. Um, and, and I truly believe that God is busy working something in the world for the sake of His kingdom. And as we've been preaching, a huge and essential part of God's eternal purposes and plans for the world is His church. And we believe that throughout the past couple of weeks that God has been ministering and speaking to us as His church for the very thing that He is preparing us for. Okay, so I know that this year has been tough, last year has been tough, um, but next year is going to be good. Um, your circumstances might not change, um, but so, neither does God. Um, and I really believe that God is setting us up for the very things that He is busy working in the world. So if you've missed any of it, please do go and catch up online. Tonight, we are finishing with chapter 6. Um, why chapter 6? Because there's only six chapters in the book of Ephesians. Just want to quickly page there. Um, and tonight, I'm going to attempt, um, I've stopped making promises to you guys that I'll attempt to preach short. I'll attempt to be done before the Grand Prix starts. That's my promise. <laughs> Only for you, Quivers. <laughs> um, no, so there's quite a lot that I want us to, to go into tonight, a lot of scriptures that I want us to go into, um, just as I believe that there's a, a pinnacle in what we discover in chapter 6 that pulls everything in the book of Ephesians together so that we can un actually understand what the purpose and reasoning behind all of this is. So before we start, I want us to pray. Um, and for tonight, you'll need an open heart, but also an open mind. And I'm going to pray for that. So close your eyes. Um, this is just so that you're not distracted. All right. So close your eyes. Holy Spirit, would you come and show us right now in Jesus' name, would you come and show us the things that's distracting our minds? Right now, Holy Spirit, would you come and bring those things into the light? Everything, Lord, that wants to be a hindrance to us receiving the Word of God tonight. Come and help us see what those things are. And then I want you, just whatever the Holy Spirit is showing you right now, just lay it down and say, Lord, I'm just giving this to you right now for the next however long Yaku decides to preach. I'm giving this to you. And some of the things that's in your mind right now are legitimate things. It might be people that you care about that might be sick. It might be things that, that's very real circumstances that you're worried about. And all of them are legitimate. Some of them are not. But whatever it is, would you entrust it to God? Say, so God, I'm choosing to trust that you love me and your word promises that you know what I need even before I ask because you love me. You're a good father. And right now, I'm just giving this into your hands, trusting you with it, asking you, Lord, that you'll give me a clear mind to receive your word tonight. I bring you my heart, Lord, and I open it up to you the one who knows me best, all my failures, all my shame, all my guilt, all the things, Lord, that I often use to disqualify myself from your presence, but I'm giving it to you right now. I thank you, Lord, that I can proclaim the love of Christ into my heart, and I pray that you'll make my heart receptive to your truth tonight. We come and silence the accuser, the enemy, the lies. We come and silence all of them, Lord. And we thank you that our hearts and our minds are open and receptive to hear and receive from you tonight. Amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians 6. 
So I'm going to major on the second part of Ephesians, but I'm going to read through the first nine verses just quickly because they're really powerful. I'm not going to preach on them too much, not even going to make a lot of notes on it. Um, There's some really good stuff for us as Christians to take from this, so just receive. It starts off to say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters. So in our context, um, hopefully none of you work for slave owners, although some of your bosses might treat you as slaves. My whole team is not here tonight, so none of them can accuse me of being a slave driver. Um, But you work for someone. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. That's a tricky one. Go and chew on it. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. Okay, that's just an introduction. Good. I hope that the Lord spoke to you whatever he wanted to speak to you from verse 1 to 9. That's not what we're preaching on. The rest is coming. So Ephesians, if you go to, um, go to the, the, the main slide. Ephesians is uh, the incredible story of God, us, and the church. And that's what we've been preaching about over the last couple of weeks. That it's a revelation of God. God revealing himself to us. It's a story of the church um, and our identity that's locked up in being part of Christ, being part of His body, and that through all of this, God has got this eternal plan to rulers and principalities in the heavenly realms. So Ephesians 6 then is um, starting with Paul's final instruction. So verse 10 to 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he's saying, finally, as a conclusion to all of the things that I've spoken to you about, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the schemes and the plans of the enemy. So Paul is saying that we are in a real battle, um, and it's not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle, and your real enemy is also not physical, it's spiritual. Okay, you guys get that. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but then you're like, you don't know some of my flesh and blood. (laughs) There's some very real people that I do not like that much. But Paul is saying that our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against spiritual forces um, and rulers and principalities in the heavenly realms. But everything that, we've, everything that we've been speaking about has been building up to this. So I'm going to do a quick overview um, of some of the things that I believe is important for you and me to understand the very real spiritual battle that we're in. So Ephesians 2, Paul writes and he says, And you, everyone say me, even you at home, say me. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So you were dead and God made you alive through Christ. So if you go to the next image, just after this, yes. And go. All right. So you need to understand that there was a gap between you and God. There's a separation between you and God because of a sinful nature. Not just the wrong things that you do but a nature, a being. So this cannot be fixed by just doing more right things. And I think often that's our approach to Christianity is there's a list of do's and a list of don'ts. And as long as I do more of the do's and don't do most of the don'ts, then I should be okay with God. But your problem with God is not a physical thing. It's not a fruit thing. There's a nature problem. There's a spiritual death that you and I have. Um, And God, through His mercy and His grace, stepped into our world. So God became man in Jesus Christ 
He lived the life that we should have lived, perfect and obedient to the will of the Father. But then Jesus also died the death that we should have died. So he died, and then three days later, he rose from the grave, um, overcoming the death, overcoming the, the penalty for sin, paying the penalty for sin. But then also he ascended into heaven. And all of that is incredible, incredible good news for you and me. But it gets better. Next verse. Then God made us alive. Everyone say me. All right? He made us alive and raised us up together with Christ and seated us alongside Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My friends, you need to understand this to understand Christianity. So go to the next picture. So whoever receives Christ, whoever um, identifies themselves with the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, gets to um, receive the forgiveness of sins, but also the gift of eternal life. And then Paul writes and he says that we together are raised together with Christ and seated alongside Him in the heavenly places. Now this is important. So before Christ, you were spiritually dead, without God, without hope in this world. But because of the work of Christ, you can receive mercy, you can receive the forgiveness of sins, but you are also made spiritually alive. And then this new spiritual alive person of yours is now seated, raised with Christ and seated alongside Him in the heavenly places. Where's Jesus? He's in heaven. All right. <laughs> um, do you guys think Jesus is assured of his salvation, that he's going to go to heaven? It's a dumb question because he's there. He's God. <laughs> there is no heaven apart from God. If you're seated alongside Christ in the heavenly places, then there's an assurance of salvation that is yours, not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done. So when you are made alive with Christ, you also receive a new position. And that's important. So, to be in Christ is to be spiritually alive, opposed to being spiritually dead. And a spiritual dead person cannot produce any good fruit that is pleasing to God. A spiritual dead person can be a good person, but they cannot produce anything that is pleasing to God. A spiritual alive person produces new fruit. To be in Christ is to have a new position seated alongside Him in the heavenly places. To be in Christ is to be assured of your salvation, knowing that when you die, you do not have to fear judgment because Jesus already took your judgment upon Himself so that you have now been given a new position and assurance of your identity and your, um, your sonship in Christ. So you don't have to fear death, which is good news. To be in Christ is to be part of the body. You cannot be part of Christ and not be part of His body. So that's some of the stuff we've spoken about over the last couple of weeks. Then Ephesians 3, verse 10, Paul writes, and he says that his purpose, God's purpose, was that now through the church, everyone say the church. Everyone, that wasn't everyone. It was like, uh, right, so everyone say the church. One, two, three. That's better. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's purpose now, remember His manifold wisdom stretching from the beginning of time to the end of time and then even beyond into eternity. This eternal plans and purposes of God is now to be revealed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose that God has already accomplished, past tense, in Christ Jesus. I know it's a lot, and I'm trusting that the pray, pray, prayer we prayed earlier is working so that whatever you feel is like too, too much, too quick, that it's sinking in somewhere, um, because all of this is important. So Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against, next verse, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. To whom is the manifold wisdom of God revealed? Rulers and authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, we have an assurance. 
right? There's a space where God has given you a new position, you have an assurance, you are redeemed, meaning that someone has stepped into your story and has unlocked the prison door that has kept you bound, but there was a price that needed to be paid, and that price was Jesus himself. So Jesus exchanged himself for your freedom. So Jesus put himself behind the prison doors. You are forgiven. It's not just that God has extended mercy to you, and I said, okay, it's fine. I know you've messed up, but I forgive you. I extend mercy to you and I understand. But he's forgiven you, meaning that he has dealt with your trespasses, never to hold it against you ever again. Friends, is that not good news? I wish we could do that always. My one friend, his, him and his wife had an argument. Um, and um, she was talking about something. And the next moment, he's like, She's like, what are you doing? She's like, no, I'm just digging up all the old cows that we've already buried. <laughs> I think it's funnier in Afrikaans, right? Ali <laughs> um, God, when He forgives you, He's saying that I'm not going to hold this against you any longer because the price has already been paid. So not only have you received mercy, but justice has also taken place. Then you are restored into your rightful relationship with God as if you have never sinned. Let that sink into your mind just for a second, that God now works with you, He acts against you, as if you have never sinned. Doesn't make sense. We have a new position. We have a new identity. You are a people of God. We are part of His body. There is unity in the body. And then there's maturity that takes place as we submit ourselves to Christ as the head, but also to one another as the body. And then from this place, we engage in the battle. That's important. There's a very real battle that you and I are part of that's happening right around us at this moment. But the place from which you engage in this battle is everything we've spoken about now. It's seated alongside Him in the heavenly places. It's not a defeatist attitude. No, you, you are more than conquerors through Christ. And we get to engage with a very real battle from a space where God has given you a position that is the, the same position where Christ is. From that space, we engage with the battle. All right. So, Ephesians six thirteen to 20. I'm going to read, and then we're going to unpack it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. It's a lot of standing. I see a lot of sitting. Okay. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet. Shod is such a weird word. It's got the, this is the New King James Version. So all the other translations say, fit your feet. All right. So shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that the utterance, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, most of you, if you, were, if you went to Sunday school, um, Kinderkerk and CSV and all of these things, at some stage of your life you would have had the armor of God illustration and someone would have had a video or had like stuff on. Um, there's, so many, there's, there's only so many stories that we can make very visible for children's church. Um, and this is one of them that's quite cool. So you would have probably heard about the armor of God. Now, I don't want to sp- I'm not going to go into too much depth into all of them. This is something that you can go and spend some time on. But I want us to run through them, and then I want us to bring us back to what I really believe God has got prepared for us as a church. So the first one is that we gird your waist with truth. So there's a belt that they would put um, around themselves. So Paul is giving them this instruction from a prophetic message in Isaiah, basically speaking about the, the, the battlefield and the soldier going into battle, but then being um, dressed for battle. So there was a belt that they would put around them. And it's not just like a belt that you and I wear on our jeans. 
there's a bit more to it. But you would gird your waist with truth and biblical truth. There's, there's a space where your life can be directed by things that are not true. Um, there's a space where your life can be directed by your emotions, uh, your feelings, your circumstances. And these can be the things that now lead the way where David writes and says, Lord, let your word be a lamp unto my feet. So we gird ourselves in the word of God, in what is true. Um, but it also speaks about integrity, honesty, a character, a type of person that you've become in Christ, that you are a person whose yes is your yes, your no is your no, that you tell the truth, that you're a person of integrity, a person of truth. The second one, the breastplate of righteousness. There's a, a nicer picture of the breastplate of righteousness. So, and, and this is important. Righteousness means that you are in right standing with God, and every area of your life is in right standing with God. Now, I think there's many areas of our lives that we can say, mm, God, I know that this thought is maybe not in right standing with you, or this behavior is maybe not in right standing with you. But you, you put on the breastplate of righteousness, not of your own righteousness, but the imputed righteousness of Jesus, something that has been given to you that you did not work for, that you did not deserve, that you did not earn. And Paul, um, the, the Bible says that in Christ we have become the righteousness of God. So the righteousness that you put on is not your own. And that's good news, friends, because our righteousness, our own good works, it fails. It fluctuates. One day we're good, one day we're not. One day we press in and we take hold of the promises of God, and some days we fall back. Some days we're not as passionate. Some days we don't even want to get up and read our Bibles. But you put on the breastplate of righteousness, not of your own, but of the righteousness of Christ. Your feet is prepared with the gospel of peace, um, a, a preparedness of mind and a readiness to respond to God's will. And it's this knowing that you have peace with God. Friends, that's good news. <laughs> you have peace with God, meaning that you can enter into His courts without fearing judgment, without fearing punishment, without fearing anger, because you have peace with God. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of what Christ has done, He has enabled you to step into the presence of God without fear, without hesitation, without limitation, because you have peace with God. I'm not asking you whether you've had a good week. I'm not asking you whether you're on track with your Bible reading plan. Because of the gospel, you can have peace with God. And then the preparedness and the readiness to not just take the gospel for yourself, but to also preach the gospel to share the gospel, to share the good news with others. Then the shield of faith, believing the Word of God. So the enemy comes in with these um, arrows, these flaming darts that want to um, either just proclaim lies into your soul and give things like, um, let's say the enemy comes in and says, God can never love you. I mean, just look at your life, look at your past, look at the things that you've done. How do you think that God can ever love you? Or maybe it's not that to that extent. Maybe just saying, God cannot love you as much as He loves that person. But then you step in with the shield of faith and say, no, the Word of God says nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. And it's a space where you shield off the arrows of the enemy that want to accuse you. You shield off the arrows of the enemy that want to sow lies into your soul, but you battle it with the Word of God. And as you um, basically point out the shield and say, nope, not getting into my heart. Nope, you're not getting close because the Word of God says. Then the helmet of salvation, and I think this one is important. Well, all of them are important. That's why they're in the Bible. Um, a couple of months ago, we had a sermon series on the battle of um, the mind. You guys remember that? Um, and like taking, cap taking captive. And we have to take captive every thought that elevates itself against the knowledge of God. And a big space where the enemy often captivates us is right here in our thinking. Um, and he sows a seed of doubt or he sows a lie and we just run with it. Um, and we apply that thing into every area of our lives. Um, and he is the great accuser. So he comes, he accuses you, and he tries to blame you, and he tries to accuse God. So maybe you've prayed and you didn't get what you prayed for, and now it's like, oh, and God is really good. So he starts to either accuse you or accuse God or accuse people around you. 
but it's in this space where we put on the, the helmet of salvation that protects our mind so that we don't allow the lies of the enemy, the accusations of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy to grab or create a stronghold in our minds. Because in that space, whatever you think on, you become. So we get to put on the helmet of salvation that protects our minds, and then the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Um, it is the weapon in your warfare. All, right? all of the others are defensive, where the sword is your offensive weapon. And if we go back to the story of Jesus where he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the accuser, by Satan, what was his um, weapon of choice? Scripture, the Word of God. So whenever the enemy accused him, he used Scripture. So here's a question for every single one of us. All right, whom of you play video games? I know there's some nerds here. <laughs> All right? Um, like, it's good to be a nerd, guys. That's how... Um, Riet and I remember when we were, um, when we were still dating, um, we would play computer games online with each other. Um, yeah, so I married a nerd as well. But um, it sucks when you run out of ammo. <laughs> and then you've got to find, try and find a space where you can reload your ammo. But if you're out of ammo in the battlefield, then that's quite a sucky, sucky position to be in. Now, you and I are in a spiritual battle. What does your ammo canister look like? Is it filled with the Word of God? Because that is your offensive weapon. That is the very thing by which you can stand against the enemy with the Word of God. Do you have enough ammo in your um, gun, in your weapon, so that you're able to actually proclaim Scripture, to proclaim truth against the lies of the enemy? So it's important that we know the Word of God. So I hope you guys are excited about next year's abide theme, abiding in the Word of God. Okay, so that's the armor. Now, um, I saw someone saying that the, um, Christianity isn't mystical in the sense that it's magic. Like um, sometimes we're like, okay, the armor of God, and I just got to proclaim the armor of God over myself, and now I have the armor of God over my life. No, it's calling to you to take action. So in all of these, it says, put on or take hold of. So it's something that you have to position yourself in, that you've got to actually act upon. It's not just a wishful thinking, oh, yeah, I've read it. Okay, God, thank you for the armor. No, we're in a spiritual battle. It's something that you actively participate in. So who is Paul speaking to? The church. Because we need to understand that when Paul spoke about the manifold wisdom of God being made known to the rulers and principalities of the heavenly realms through the church, he changed the narrative that God is no longer speaking about his plans for the world and his plans into eternity and thinking about individuals. Yes, you and I um, are individually loved by God and you are individually saved. You, you cannot be added to a corporate salvation. God loves you. God chose you. God saved you. He redeemed you. But then He added you to His body. And now when God has a plan for the world, when God has a plan to redeem the nations, when God has a plan against the schemes and the powers of the heavenly realms, He's speaking to His church. So Paul is writing to the church. Um, so we're not just putting on the armor for ourselves and for our own sake. We're putting it on for the sake of one another. And friends, when you're in the battlefield and your friend next to you's ammo is low, what do you do? You share ammo, <laughs> all right? If his shoes are loose, you help him tie it. If his breastplate is missing, you try and cover him because we're in this together. So we put on the armor, not just for ourselves, but for one another because the spiritual attack is not just against you. Yes, the enemy wants to take you out. But it's against the body of Christ. And what are one of the things that we spoke about in Ephesians 4? That there is a unity that God calls us to as the church. So what will the enemy try and attack? Our unity. A house divided cannot stand. So the enemy will try and attack our unity. So sometimes we just put on the armor so that we will guard our unity, our identity, our purpose and calling as the church of Jesus Christ. All right, so the battle is real. The battle is spiritual, not natural. 
Um, so you and I are in a spiritual battle with spiritual beings. Um, all of us have probably seen like uh, exorcism movies or you've heard about it or you've seen a movie trailer, all right? And like, oh my mind, that is so weird. Now, spiritual warfare is not about um, charisma. It's not standing on stage and screaming at things or shouting at things and then they do certain things. Spiritual warfare is about you and I understanding our dependency on Christ. Apart from Him, we have zero authority over the evil one. Apart from Him, we have nothing, nothing to give, nothing to bring. Like um, the, in the Gospel of John 15, it says, apart from Him, we can do nothing. So spiritual warfare is accurate, accurately positioning yourself, being dependent on God. Say, God, apart from you, I've got nothing but in you, and we're going to get to that. So, we are in an intense, epic war. Okay, we all like war movies. Um, we all like these scenes of battle, and then there's a victory, and all of that. I hope some, of, I hope all of us like it. But we are in an intense, epic war, and we are in exciting times because we get to be part of God's plan in this war. We get to be part of the battle. And then Revelation 12, and if you've read the book of Revelation, it obviously gives us insight into the end times when Jesus comes back. But Revelation 12 verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Right? So salvation and the power of the kingdom of God has come in Christ and the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So you need to understand that there is an accuser. Friends, we are not one another's accusers. <laughs> there is an accuser. We are not it. We are not one another's accusers, the church. We are not even the accusers of those who do not know Christ. The job of the church is not to judge everything that's happening outside or to accuse people. There is an accuser, and his name is Satan. But here's the good news. He's been cast down. He's been cast down. So even though, remember, your position is spiritual, seated alongside Christ in the heavenly places, and from a spiritual perspective, the enemy has already been cast down. He goes on and says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. They overcame him, the evil one, the accuser, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. The blood of the Lamb silences every single accusation that the enemy has against you. Every claim that the enemy makes against your life, the blood of the Lamb silences. It's the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The finished work. Nothing needs to be added. Nothing still needs to happen. It is done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It silences the accuser. And then by the word of their testimony. Friends, there's a space where the, the gospel not just affects our lives, but by the word of our testimony, others get to experience the good news. But here's the thing. A, a, a gospel that only transforms you and doesn't transcend into transforming others is a half gospel. It's in the testimony that your, the, the word of your testimony, that your own Christianity gets rooted and be, um, is established. Apart from the word of your testimony, where your life gets to testify about the work of Christ that is real, that is evident, that has changed your life, apart from that, through your life to other people, there is a foundation in your own Christianity that will be lacking. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and then they did not love their lives even unto death. Now, when we read this, we think of corona. <laughs> I hope I don't die of corona. Now, Paul is speaking to people who were physically persecuted. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a conference for many of the different um, regional leaders in every nation in Dubai, and they contacted the leader of the church in China and said, um, you should not come because the persecution on them as a church and him as a leader has raised significantly. Um, and shortly after, he was actually in prison, um, 
And they just told him that we know who you are, we know where you meet, we know what you do, know whether we're watching you. Um, so when, when, when they read about persecution, it's not something that's foreign to them. For us, it's a little bit foreign. But here's the thing. They did not love their lives even unto death. This life is not the be-all and end-all. The things of this world, the experiences of this world, the riches of this world, the things you can accomplish, the places you can see, etc. That's not the, the goal of life. That's not the, um, that's not the main aim of life. And I think often when we think about life and we think about our dreams and our plans, like, yeah, I've got this idea for a holiday destination and I've got these career plans and I've got these family plans. And we sometimes make them the main thing. And Paul is writing, in, uh, um, John is writing in Revelation saying, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony and not loving your life even unto death, we overcome. And as long as we make some of these earthly things, these things that are temporary, as long as we make them the main priority, or as long as they are at the forefront of our agenda, we will struggle with Christianity. You'll struggle with Christianity when the, the greatest expression or experience of joy is found in this life alone. Because God did not set it up that way. Because He's created us for eternity with Him. And um, so often throughout the Bible, it says that we should not neglect meeting together. We should encourage one another. We should persist in prayer all the more as you see the day, capital D, approaching, speaking about the return of Christ. We need to understand that the Bible tells us what the world will look like as we draw nearer and nearer to, re to the return of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, it does not get easier. It does not get easier, friends. And, and I think if we have this idea that our Christianity is to keep us safe and comfortable and it makes all of our dreams and desires come true, now that's a fairy tale. But God is giving us something that is sure, that is trustworthy, and that can cause hope to arise in your heart even in the most unhopeful circumstances because our hope is not in this world alone, it's in the next. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives even unto death. So we are challenged to have an eternal mindset, that to, to align ourselves with God's eternal plans and purposes, that this life is but a vapor in comparison to eternity, that we live with eternity in, wine, in mind. We plan our calendars with eternity in mind. This morning, um, uh, I was reading through Revelation 14 or 15, and I said to read, in Scripture it says that there will come a time when the mercy seat of God is inaccessible, meaning that there's only a limited time where we can still intercede for people who do not know Christ. How does the truth that some people still need to hear about Jesus and there's a limited time available affect the way you spend your time, affect the way we spend our money, affect the way we, we schedule our lives and the things that are important to us? We approach our Christianity with a long-term mindset, meaning that when Jesus saves you, He's not giving you a false promise to say, Follow me and you will become rich. Follow me and your life will be happy. Follow me and everything will work out as, you, as you've planned. Follow me and everything will come back to just how it should be. My friends, again, that's a fairy tale. Jesus promises and says, in this life you will face much hardship, but know this, I have overcome the world. When we follow Jesus, we follow him with eternity in mind. Jesus, I'll follow you even unto death because I know that it's... Um, I've, got, I've been granted access into eternity, even if we lose our lives. Um, there's a space where you can be a passive Christian, all right? Meaning that, yeah, you know about Jesus and you're saved. You're really born again, but you're passive. Um, you're like an, an ap there's, there's an apathy in your heart, meaning a, a don't care attitude. Like, yeah, I'm saved, but I don't really care about the things that's happening in the world. I don't really care about people who don't know Jesus. I don't really care about people who are struggling. I don't really care about poverty and all of that. I'm just okay. Um, but the danger when you are a passive Christian, a nominal Christian, then your life has very little influence in this world. And when you are a nominal Christian who has very little influence in this world, you become a very easy target for the enemy to snatch you away. The Bible warns us that in the last days, many will fall away from the faith. But we are not of those who shrink back. 
We are not of those who shrink back. So God calls us to participate in this, in this battle. I've got a couple more scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 16. And he, Jesus, died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And friends, this is important as you and I engage in the spiritual battle. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil and darkness. We regard no one according to the flesh. You might have people in your life that you really dislike. You might have people in your life that really hurt you. You might be peop have people in your life that, um, by all accounts, are wicked and evil. But you need to understand that we do not judge according to the flesh. We judge according to the Spirit. And the moment you judge a person according to the Spirit, there is or one of two possibilities, spiritually alive or spiritually dead. If you're spiritually dead, you have been taken captive by the forces of darkness, meaning you have no choice but to produce the fruits of the devil. You obey your father, the devil, when you are spiritually dead. And the thing that needs to be birthed in your heart when you're dealing with a spiritually dead person is compassion because you know that it's by grace alone that you have been saved and have been made alive in Christ. A compassion stirs, stirs in your heart for those who do not know Jesus because we do not judge according to the flesh. We judge according to the Spirit. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's spiritual. So there's spiritual strongholds, spiritual blindness, spiritual death. We're at war. And we put on the armor of God, but the battle is spiritual, not natural. Um, go to the next diagram. I'll quickly explain this to you. There's a spiritual realm, a natural realm. Okay, You and I are sitting in the physical here, the natural, but we're also seated alongside Christ in the spiritual. Now, God created the world. In the beginning, God created. So that which is spiritual comes before that which is natural. That which is spiritual will manifest itself in that what is natural. So when you believe a spiritual lie, it will manifest in the natural. Does that make sense? So when you believe something about you that's no longer true, it will still bear fruit in your life because you've attached yourself to a spiritual truth or a spiritual lie that will make mani be made manifest in your life. Now what needs to happen is we cancel the lie. Now, for you to cancel the lie, you need to know the truth. Then we repent. God, I'm sorry that I'm believing a lie about myself, about you, about the world, but now I connect myself with a new truth, and that truth will be then made manifest in, um, in my life. So it's not just for our sakes. You see, some of us are trusting for friends, family members, colleagues, workplaces, cities, nations. And there are spiritual strongholds, spiritual lies um, written over people's lives, written over cities, written over campuses, over nations. And we engage with the lie to break it, but then to replace it with the truth. Now, because the battle is spiritual, not natural, how do we engage with the battle? Paul says, Ephesians 6 verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray. So we put on the armor of God, right, to be able to, uh, to be well fitted or equipped for the battle. But prayer isn't part of the armor. Prayer isn't um, a weapon for the battle. Prayer is the battlefield. Prayer is the battlefield. If you want to actively participate in God's plan for the world with eternity in mind, He calls you to pray. And friends, I need you to understand, and for us, when you become a follower of Christ, you are added into Christ, but you're added into His body, you're added into His mission. His mission is for me and you to pray. That God calls us into the spiritual battle, and um, 
prayer is essential for you to have an intimate relationship with your Creator so that you can know God personally. That's where you get to commune with God personally. You get to share your heart with God. You get to share your mind with God, your fears, all of those things. But you also get to connect with what is on God's heart. And He gets to deposit truth into your heart. But prayer is also essential for you to participate in the very real battle you and I are in. We do not get to exit the battle. We need to understand that. Um, you, whether you participate or not, you do not get to exit the battle. You are in it. And a Christian who does not pray will lack intimacy, is susceptible to nominal Christianity that I mentioned earlier, um, and then is easy prey for the enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So God calls us to prayer. Now, I've got two more scriptures, three more scriptures, but I want the band to come on. There's a lot, all right? And I really hope that the prayer we prayed, that God is working stuff in your heart and in your mind. The band can come up, yeah. There's a, there's a very real spiritual battle, church. The battle is there. And, and you and I are in the battle whether we want to be in it or not. But the work of Christ has given you a position of victory so that you can engage with the battle from a place where we stand as overcomers. We are seated alongside Christ in the heavenly places. He's placed you amongst one another. So it's not just you alone, ranger. God has given us one another, and we together get to engage in this battle. He's given us the armor of God that we can um, almost equip ourselves with so that we can be effective in this battle. But how do we engage in the battle? We pray. Prayer precedes everything that we want to see happen in the world today. You want to see revival? You want to see some of your family members get saved? You want to see your workplace encounter Christ? You want to see our nation encounter Jesus? It starts with prayer. When we share the gospel with someone and they respond, yes, there's a physical act of sharing, preaching the good news of Jesus. You telling someone your testimony, but I promise you, before that person responded, someone prayed if it wasn't you. Prayer precedes the very things that we want to see happen in the world because whatever is spiritual precedes what happens in the natural. God calls us to pray. Romans 8, 37 to 38 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. There's a spiritual battle that you and I are in, but God places you in His love. And tonight, I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what your Christianity looks like. I don't know whether you're actively engaging with the purposes of God or whether you are maybe a bit consumed about the things of this world. But I do know this, that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And if you choose to step back into the love of God and to be positioned again alongside Him for the very thing that He has caused you to still be here, He's faithful. He is faithful. John says that there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Maybe it's fear of punishment. Maybe you're like, oh, you don't know my life. Perfect love casts out fear. Maybe it's fear of death. Maybe it's fear of the battle. Maybe there's a space where um, participating in the battle and thinking about spiritual realm. Maybe that's like, no, no, I rather don't want to go there. Like, um, I've maybe seen too many horror movies or heard stories or stuff. But there's no fear in love. Again, you can choose to not participate in the battle, but you cannot exit the battle. You are in it. But God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness in Christ Jesus so that we can stand. 
so that we can stand. As we're at the end of this year, the enemy is quick to bring a spirit of discouragement, to bring a spirit of hopelessness, to bring a spirit of despair. Paul says we can stand. Why? Not in our own strength, not in our own might, but in the power of His might. And friends, there's more, not just for you to stand. God didn't give up everything so that you and I can just survive until He gets back. No, we are called to rule and reign with Christ for His sake. You get to actively participate in the spiritual battle so that many more people can get to know Jesus. So that one day when we do get into heaven, the fruit of our labor is not riches and things that this world cannot give you. It's souls. It's people. People who have come to know Christ because we stepped into the spiritual battle. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. See, Jesus, when He left the earth, He said to His disciples, It's good for you that I go away so that the Helper can come, the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit has been given to us as a seal and a guarantee of our eternal promise that awaits. But the Holy Spirit is 100% God and He abides in you. The Holy Spirit is spiritual. Friends, you need the Holy Spirit to engage in a spiritual battle. But the Holy Spirit is also holy. And His agenda in our lives is to work the holiness of God. And we're going to take a time where we're just going to allow God to come and minister into us. Um, and whether you want to sing along to the next song or just, just be, would you allow the Holy Spirit to come and speak to you? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you? If there's an element of fear maybe still in your life, would you come and allow the Holy Spirit to minister the love of God that nothing can come, compare with into your heart? If there's an element of apathy or passivity in your life, would you respond to what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you right now? But would you just open yourself and say, Holy Spirit, I make myself available and open to you to do, for you to do what you want to do.